The Civil War Battle Series, The Battle for Culp's Hill. This is part one of a three-part series. In part one, we dive into the battle itself. From there, we examine the leadership, their decisions, and the impact they had on the outcome. Finally, we focus on the political side of the battle and try to answer the question, how has political viewpoints impacted the way we view the outcome? So, before we get started, go ahead and like and follow and enable the notifications so you won't miss each episode. The second day of Gettysburg witnessed a battle less dramatic but equally strategic as Pickett's charge, the struggle for Culp's Hill. While attention often focuses on the bloody repulse at Little Round Top, the fight on the right flank of the Union line held immense weight. Yet the Confederate attack suffered a crucial delay, raising questions of blame and missed opportunities. This series delves into the chaos of Culp's Hill, examining the complexities of command, unexpected obstacles, and ultimately the elusive nature of assigning sole culpability. General Ewell, tasked with flanking the Union right, faced logistical hurdles. His Second Corps had marched all day and, in the confusion of Gettysburg streets, lost vital time. By the time his men neared Culp's Hill, dusk was approaching, diminishing the element of surprise. Adding to the delay were the unforeseen challenges of Spangler's Spring, a natural choke point forcing Confederate columns to merge into a vulnerable single file. These initial hindrances set the stage for a less-than-ideal attack. However, pinning the blame solely on logistical mishaps is oversimplifying. General Johnson, leading the assault, opted for a piecemeal approach, sending brigades uphill in staggered waves. This tactic, intended to maintain pressure, ultimately fractured the attack's momentum. Additionally, Union reinforcements alerted by earlier Confederate movements began bolstering Culp's Hill, further blunting the initial thrust. Communication breakdowns on both sides also played a key role. Yule, expecting swift success, remained at a distance, hindering effective response to the evolving situation on the hill. Therefore, attributing fault requires a nuanced understanding of the battle's dynamics. Logistical delays did indeed handicap the Confederates, but Johnson's tactical choices and communication lapses undeniably contributed to the attack's sluggishness. Moreover, the timely arrival of Union reinforcements cannot be disregarded. In the fog of war, pointing fingers at isolated factors misses the intricate web of circumstances that shape the course of the battle. Ultimately, the Battle of Culp's Hill stands as a microcosm of war's complexity, a tapestry woven with miscalculations, unforeseen obstacles, and valiant stands of individuals on both sides. Unraveling the tangled threads of blame becomes an elusive exercise, forcing us to acknowledge the interconnectedness of events and the limitations of attributing singular culpability in the face of such chaotic human drama. Culp's Hill, therefore, transcends mere finger-pointing. It serves as a testament to the tenacity of the soldiers, the fortunes of battle, and the enduring mystery of who truly holds the reins of war's unpredictable outcome. On July 2, 1863, amidst the carnage and chaos of Gettysburg, a crucial struggle unfolded on the fringe of the battle. While grand clashes roared on Cemetery Ridge and Little Round Top, a fight of equal consequences for the tide of the war simmered on Culp's Hill, a rocky promontory anchoring the Union's right flank. Here, under the oppressive summer sun and in the lengthening shadows of twilight, a battle raged that, though often overshadowed, proved critical to the Union's ultimate victory. The morning of July 2nd found the Union Army reeling from a disastrous first day. Battered and demoralized, they clung to the high ground around Cemetery in Culp's Hill, the latter entrusted to the 12th Corps and General George S. Green's unwavering brigade. 
Meanwhile, General Yule, seeking to exploit Union disarray, planned a flanking attack on Culp's Hill. His Confederate brigades, fueled by momentum and thirsty for victory, surged towards the hill in the late afternoon. The ensuing clash was a fierce ballet of musket fire and bayonet charges. Green's men, though outnumbered, held their ground with resolute tenacity. They dug in behind hastily constructed breastworks, transforming the once serene field into a maze of earthen fortifications. With each volley, musket smoke choked the air, obscuring the sun and transforming the battle into a spectral roam. The cries of the wounded and the thunderous roar of cannons reverberated across the hills, creating a symphony of pain and destruction. Despite Green's valiant stand, the Confederates gained ground. They overran some Union trenches on the lower slopes, their battle cries raising in triumph. Yet Green's unwavering New Yorkers refused to yield. They rallied on the higher slopes, their muskets spitting defiance against the oncoming tide. This desperate struggle reached a zenith as dusk approached, casting long shadows that stretched across the bloody terrain. Just as the Confederate victory seemed within reach, the tide began to turn. The relentless Union reinforcements, fresh from the crucible of earlier engagements, poured onto the field. With renewed vigor, they joined Green's men, pushing back the exhausted Confederates. Through the fading light, a final surge of Union defiance broke the southern advance, leaving Culp's Hill bathed in the blood of both sides. The battle for Culp's Hill ended in a bloody stalemate, yet its significance transcends the immediate results. The Union line held, preventing the Confederate flanking maneuver that could have crippled the entire position. Culp's Hill remained firmly in Union hands, securing a vital artery for supplies and communication. More importantly, this hard-fought victory instilled fresh hope and determination in the battered Union ranks, paving the way for the ultimate triumph on Day 3. The Battle of Culp's Hill, though less celebrated than its more dramatic counterparts, stands as a testament to the indomitable spirit of American soldiers. It was a fight in the shadows, won not by grand maneuvers, by the grit and unwavering conviction of men like General Green and his New Yorkers. This battle's legacy lies not in its size, but in its impact, a crucial chapter in the story of Gettysburg, where valor in the face of adversity secured the dawn of victory. Rifle flashes erupted at intervals on the base of the slope. The flashes gave away the location of the Confederate troops, advancing in large numbers in the darkness of night on July 2, 1863. On the eastern side of Culp's Hill, southeast of the town of Gettysburg, the 4,000 rebels and three brigades belonging to Major General Edward Allegheny Johnson's division of soldiers hailing from the Old Dominion. Waiting for their attack on the eastern slopes of the key position on the extreme right of the Union Army of the Potomac was a solitary brigade that belonged to Major General Henry Slocum's 12th Corps, led by one of the oldest officers in the Army. The Union Army commander, Major General George Meade, had stripped the hill of most of its troops to reinforce other parts of his line, and 1,300 rifles of Brigadier General George Green's 3rd Brigade of Major General Alpheus Williams' 1st Division braced themselves for the daring night attack. The Union troops had evened the odds against the superior attacking force by erecting strong breastworks of logs that integrated the large boulders and ledges that dotted the slopes of the hill. Most of the troops would be able to fire through slits in the barricades at the advancing rebels, which would greatly reduce the likelihood that they would be killed or maimed by the low-velocity bullets and balls aimed at them. Nevertheless, the weight of the Confederate attack was enough to rattle the nerves of the most seasoned veterans in the blue ranks. Many of the Yankees knew that they were entrusted with holding a crucial part of the Union line. If the Confederates could drive them from their fortified positions, the rebels could seize control of a portion of the Baltimore Pike, Meade's lifeline to his supply base just 20 miles away at Westminster, Maryland. If that occurred, the entire Union army would be forced to fall back south, possibly uncovering Baltimore and putting Lee's army to much closer range of the nation's capital. Aware of their solemn duty, Green's bluecoats put their minds to the task. 
They steeled their nerves for a firefight in which they were the principal actors that came at the close of the second day of a titanic clash on northern soil midway through the conflict. The name Gettysburg is seared into the American consciousness as the bloodiest three days in our great republic's history. The battle ended the Confederacy's dream of a separate nation after two years of back-and-forth jousting turned irreversibly against the secession states. Even after all the millions of words that have been written about this battle during ensuing decades, there are still aspects of the Gettysburg decision that remain obscure. The struggle for a nondescript headline called Culp's Hill ranks for strategic significance right up there with the legendary chapters as Little Round Top and Pickett's Charge. Being overlooked takes nothing away from the significance of this aspect of the battle. In the wake of the Union Army's disaster at Chancellorsville, under the command of Major General Fighting Joe Hooker, a campaign that unfolded during the first week of May 1863, the U.S. government replaced Hooker on June 28th with Major General George Gordon Meade. President Abraham Lincoln and his top military advisors selected Meade, who most recently had led the Fifth Corps at Chancellorsville, because Meade did not scare easily and was able to keep a clear head on the battlefield under pressure. Meade lacked the charisma of Major General George McClellan, one of the early commanders of the Army of the Potomac, or Hooker, and his appointment to replace Fighting Joe surprised many in the Army. General Robert E. Lee's Confederate Army of Northern Virginia had won a decisive victory over Hooker at the crossroads of Chancellorsville, a short distance west of Fredericksburg, Virginia. But the success was tainted by the loss of Confederate Lieutenant General Thomas Stonewall Jackson. Stonewall died of complications from a friendly fire wound received while following up his May 2nd flank attack on the Union 11th Corps, which won the battle for the South. In the aftermath of the battle, Lee reorganized his army into three corps, with the newly created Confederate Second and Third Corps, commanded by Lieutenant General Richard Old Baldhead Ewell and Lieutenant General A.P. Hill, respectively. General James Longstreet commanded the Confederate First Corps. Lee decided to follow up the victory at Chancellorsville by invading the North a second time to seize food from the fertile farmlands of Pennsylvania and relieve the pressure on the battle-scarred landscape of northern Virginia. Lee's forces began shifting to the Shenandoah Valley the first week of June in preparation for the invasion. Using the Blue Ridge Mountains as a screen, the infantry marched north unopposed. To ensure the Union Army was confused as to the exact location of the Confederates, Lee entrusted Major General Jeb Stewart with using his superb cavalry to keep Union forces on the east side of the mountains from being able to capture the mountain gaps. Stewart did that job well, and the 70,000-strong Confederate Army of Northern Virginia finished crossing the Potomac River on or about June 24th. Yule's Corps, which formed the vanguard of the Confederate Army, fanned out and marched all the way to Carlisle in York, Pennsylvania, by the time Meade took command of the pursuing Army of the Potomac. Having no notion of the exact whereabouts of Lee's forces, Meade sent Brigadier General John Buford's 1st Division of the Union Cavalry Corps into Pennsylvania to locate Lee's army. Following Buford were the three corps, forming the vanguard of the Army of the Potomac, led by Union First Corps Commander Major General John Reynolds. On June 30th, Buford ran headlong into the middle of the Confederate Army, moving east, when he encountered infantry of Hill's Corps on the Chambersburg Pike west of Gettysburg. Buford fired off a dispatch to Reynolds, indicating that he had found the main body of Lee's army, and Reynolds immediately ordered his three corps to march to Gettysburg. The following day, Buford consolidated his command, which was spread out, looking for Lee's army on the ridge west of Gettysburg. Buford planned to have his men, who were armed with various makes of single-shot breech-loading carbines, fight dismounted. This would force the Confederate infantry commanders to deploy their men from column into line of battle, slowing their advance and revealing their strength. Confederate Major General Henry Heath's division of Hill's Corps ran into Buford's dismounted troopers at about 7.30 a.m. on July 1st. 
Reynolds had arrived at Gettysburg ahead of his troops that morning, and he and Buford conferred at the Lutheran Seminary near Chambersburg Pike on the west side of Gettysburg. The lead elements of Reynolds' first corps soon arrived, and the general deployed them on McPherson's Ridge and allowed Buford's cavalry to fall back into new positions around the town in the anticipation of the arrival of the Confederate units. By noon, Major General Robert Rhodes' division of Ewell's Corps had arrived and occupied Oak Hill, northwest of the town, which endangered the right flank of the Union First Corps. By that time, Reynolds had been killed by a Confederate sharpshooter, and the command of the Corps had passed to Major General Abner Doubleday, the First Corps' senior division commander. Federal reinforcements arrived in the nick of time. Having made a forced march to Gettysburg, Major General Oliver Howard deployed the bulk of his 11th Corps north of Gettysburg to meet Rhodes' attack. The arrival of Major General Jubal Early's division of Ewell's Corps via Rhodes leading into the town from the northeast put it astride Howard's right flank. The unlucky Howard, whose corps had been smashed by Jackson, was once again whipped by the Confederates under Early. Early's division proceeded to roll up Howard's line. Howard's men fled south through the streets of Gettysburg toward the safety of Cemetery Hill. With Howard's corps routed, Doubleday's infantry soon found Confederate infantry attacking them from the rear, and they also retreated toward Cemetery Hill. Ewell's 3rd Division under Johnson soon arrived and deployed on Early's left flank. Lee arrived on the battlefield while the Union retreat was in progress. To, to partially offset the command advantage, the Union forces benefited from the arrival of Union 2nd Corps Commander Major General Winfield Scott Hancock. When, when Meade learned of Reynolds' death, he sent Hancock to take command of the Army until he was able to arrive to Gettysburg in person. Hancock immediately began deploying the disorganized Union infantry to receive a Confederate follow-on attack. As he went about establishing a strong position at Cemetery Hill, Hancock became anxious over the vulnerability of their right flank. Seeing several limbered batteries belonging to Reynolds retreating from Seminary Ridge toward Cemetery Hill, Hancock shouted for the captain of one of them to come over to him. The officer Hancock summoned was Captain Greenleaf Stevens, commander of the 5th Maine Battery, 1st Corps. Hancock pointed to Culp's Hill, ordered Stevens to deploy his battery of Napoleon 12-pound cannons on the hill to prevent the enemy from occupying it. Stevens, who believed the thickly wooded summit of Culp's Hill prevented him from unlimbering atop it, decided instead to deploy on a knoll on the west end of Culp's Hill Ridgeline. Stewart's battery was soon shelling the Confederates. The knoll that Stevens chose for his position became known thereafter as Stevens Knoll. Unfortunately for Stevens, he had no infantry support to prevent enemy sharpshooters from picking off his artillerymen one at a time. Hancock, who soon noted the weakness at 5 p.m., ordered Colonel William Robinson commanding the retreating 1st Brigade, known as the Iron Brigade, of Brigadier General James Wadsworth's 1st Division of the 1st Corps, to march his troops to Culp's Hill, which lay about a half mile southeast of Cemetery Hill. Cemetery Hill was indeed a formidable position, rising a hundred feet above the terrain over which Confederates would have to attack. The local burial ground's most visible landmark was its arched brick gatehouse. The southwestern side of the hill was laced with walls and fences that would serve as a ready-made breastwork for the infantry. Its smooth, unforested top offered an excellent location for artillery. Just south of Cemetery Hill lay Cemetery Ridge, and east of Cemetery Hill was Culp's Hill, along with Big Round Top and Little Round Top, which lay south beyond Cemetery Ridge. The high ground south of Gettysburg would serve over the next two days of battle as the Union Army's fishhook defensive line. The fish hook began at Big Round Top and ran north toward Cemetery Ridge until it curved at Cemetery Hill. Culp's Hill formed the barb of the fishhook, anchoring the extreme right of the Union's positions at Gettysburg. Culp's Hill was named for farmer Henry Culp, who owned the property in 1863 and who would lose a nephew fighting for the Union in the battle. 
with its heavily wooded and easily defensible slopes, Culp's Hill was the perfect anchor for the far right of the Union line. Rock Creek flows past Culp's Hill on the east side, and the Baltimore Pike skirts the hill to the southwest. The rise is actually two hills. The higher upper hill rises sharply about 180 feet above Rock Creek. About 400 yards south, the lower hill rises 80 feet over the same watercourse. The lower hill slopes south towards a swale called Spangler's Meadow, which contains Spangler's Spring. A saddle-shaped ridge connects the two elevations. Hancock also ordered Colonel Ira Grover's 7th Indiana Infantry, 2nd Division, 1st Corps, to join the Iron Brigade on top of Culp's Hill. Lieutenant Colonel Rufus Dahl, 6th Wisconsin Infantry, unloaded entrenching tools from its supply wagon and began entrenching on the upper hill in anticipation of an imminent rebel attack. Because of the shallow earth, the soldiers were not able to dig deep trenches. Instead, they felled trees and appropriated cordwood stacked by farmers. Like all of the large hills at Gettysburg, the crests and slopes contained boulders of many shapes and sizes, and the soldiers incorporated them into their construction when possible. To finish off these breastworks, they capped them with head logs. When finished, the soldiers were almost completely protected because they were able to fire at the enemy from a slit between the head log and the part of the breastworks beneath it. This form of entrenching would continue throughout the battle as fresh units were rotated onto Culp's Hill and the line extended the length of the upper and lower hills. No sooner had the Union troops entrenched than Confederate skirmishers began slowly working their way up the western slope of the upper hill. Johnson had arrayed the bulk of his division on the west bank of Rock Creek. He was under the misconception that the upper hill was unoccupied. After nightfall, his scouts blundered into the 7th Indiana, precipitating a flurry of rifle fire in the darkness. The rebels scurried back down to report the Yankees' presence to a surprise Johnson. Just before dusk, Yule had meticulously studied through a telescope the terrain of Cemetery Hill and the position of the Union troops atop it, and decided the position was too strong to be overcome by direct assault. He did, however, realize that by taking Culp's Hill, his troops could outflank the Union forces on Cemetery Hill. The problem was that Lee had ordered him to move his command to the opposite end of the Confederate line to guard against Federal thrust at that sector of the battlefield. Yule rode to Lee's bivouac and convinced his superior to allow his corps to remain on the left and secure Culp's Hill. Just after midnight, Yule sent a runner to Johnson with orders to take possession of the hill if you have not done so already. Johnson had formed a line of battle after dark and sent a reconnaissance party up the taller peak to see if it was unoccupied or lightly held, but it had been reported that the Federals were there in force. Johnson was overestimating the number of Union occupiers and reported inflated figures to Yule, asking for further orders. The Yankees were being slowly but steadily reinforced, but when Johnson received his first response, they were still too few to have withstood a major assault by Johnson's four brigades. By the time he had received confirmation from Yule late the next morning, the Yankees had absorbed sufficient reinforcements and had thrown up adequate breastworks to withstand the planned assault. The Confederates had wasted a promising opportunity to breach Meade's defensive line. Lee's final orders to Yule for July 2nd were for the old bald head to make a demonstration against Union forces in front of him, and if that demonstration was promising, to develop it into a full-scale attack. The position at Culp's Hill was just as important to the survival of the Union Army as the two round tops on the opposite end of the battlefield. If Yule's corps could capture Culp's Hill, the Confederates would be able to seize control of the Baltimore Pike on the opposite side. The Baltimore Pike was the best road between Gettysburg and the nearest Union railhead at Westminster, Maryland. 
Cutting the Baltimore Pike south of Cemetery Hill would likely force Meade to withdraw from the battlefield over roads of poorer quality and seek a new defensive position much farther south. After a tense night, substantial Union reinforcements arrived at Culp's Hill. Brigadier General Alpheus Williams, 1st Division, and Brigadier General John Geary, 2nd Division of the 12th Corps, marched up Culp's Hill at 6 a.m. on July 2nd. The additional troops allowed the Union Army to extend its line from the upper hill to the lower hill. The Union Army was fortunate to have Brigadier General George Green, a civil engineer with extensive experience, leading one of the brigades atop Culp's Hill. He ordered his men to entrench facing east adjacent to Wadsworth Brigade. The 62-year-old Rhode Island native, who had overseen many large construction projects as a civil engineer, had rejoined the Army in January of 1862 as Colonel of the 60th New York Infantry and subsequently fought at Cedar Mountain, Antietam, and Chancellorsville. Green personally inspected the construction of the field works to ensure that they were well made and that the troops occupying them could withstand any assault by superior forces. Our position and the front were covered with a heavy growth of timber, free from undergrowth with large ledges of rock projecting above the surface, Green wrote of his brigade's position on the upper hill. Those rocks and trees offered good cover for marksmen. The surface was very steep on our left, diminishing to a gentle slope on our right. By noon on July 2nd, the full length of Culp's Hill was strongly manned and fortified in anticipation of the pending Confederate assault. By midday on July 2nd, the front-line Union defensive positions at Culp's Hill were held by Wadsworth's division of the 1st Corps on the left of the upper hill facing north, Green's brigade of the 12th Corps facing east, and Brigadier General Thomas Kane's brigade of the 12th Corps on the lower hill also facing east. Dug in behind these primary positions was a second line comprising the 12th Corps brigades of Colonel Charles Candy, Colonel Archibald McDougall, Colonel Silas Calgrove, and Brigadier General Henry Lockwood extending from Spangler's Spring through an area called McAllister's Woods. Lee ordered attacks that morning on both ends of the Yankee line. It took Ewell until 4 p.m. to get his troops to deploy to support Lieutenant General James Longstreet's 1st Corps assault on the Union left. Ewell used the sound of Longstreet's attack to the south as a signal, but instead of sending an infantry charge, he limited his demonstration to shelling the Union lines, believing this would suffice to dissuade the Federals from opposing Longstreet. The demonstration was carried out by Major Joseph Latimer, commanding Andrew's Artillery Battalion of Johnson's Division. The battalion comprised four batteries stationed on Benner's Hill, which fired on Union forces on Cemetery Hill and Culp's Hill. As many as 40 Yankee guns on Cemetery Hill soon found the range of the rebel artillery atop Benner's Hill and shelled it to devastating effect. As his guns were being withdrawn, Latimer was struck and killed by shrapnel. The withdrawal of the Confederate guns deprived Johnson's infantry of artillery support for the remainder of the day. Ewell's guns atop Benner's Hill did an acceptable job of hammering their target, but this did not convince Meade to sit tight and wait out the barrage. Meade sent the 12th Corps south to face Longstreet, which left only Green's brigade atop Culp's Hill. Green extended his line to his right to cover as much of the lower hill as possible, but his small force would be stretched dangerously thin should they be hit by a determined Confederate attack. Green had kept most of his troops on his left, which meant that those on the right had so much of the breastwork to occupy that they were stationed a foot apart from each other, thus presenting a dangerously thin line against an enemy advancing in multiple ranks. The Confederates, however, were throwing the bulk of their available forces against the Union left and center, not realizing how weakly the right was held. As darkness gathered at 7 p.m., the rebel pressure on the Union left and center was running out of steam. Realizing this, Ewell belatedly commenced his main infantry assault. Three brigades of Johnson's division prepared to ford Rock Creek and assault the eastern slope of Culp's Hill. 
The Confederate brigades, right to left, were led by Brigadier General John Jones. Brigadier General Francis Nickel, under the command of Colonel Jesse Williams, replacing Nichols, who had been seriously wounded at Chancellorsville, and Brigadier General George Marilyn Stewart. Johnson's 4th Brigade, Brigadier General James Walker's Stonewall Brigade, was to follow the other three brigades. But Walker was preoccupied with Union forces stationed east of Culp's Hill and was late to join the attack. There was still sufficient daylight for Green to see the magnitude of the attack bearing down on him, and he hurriedly summoned reinforcements from Wadsworth and Howard, whose troops were tightly packed on Cemetery Hill in anticipation of an attack on their front by Early's division. Wadsworth sent three regiments and Howard sent four. The Union reinforcements came bearing additional ammunition. Jones had detached one of his six regiments, the 50th Virginia, to guard Confederate artillery posted on Benner's Hill. The remaining five regiments had to attack up the steepest, heavily forested, taller peak of Culp's Hill. Johnson's three brigades splashed through the shallow waters of Rock Creek and pressed on toward the east slope of Culp's Hill. As the fighting developed, Jones struck Green's left, Williams hit Green's center, and Stewart attacked Green's right. As Jones' regiments marched towards Culp's Hill, artillery shells fired by Captain R.B. Ricketts' 1st Pennsylvania artillery crashed into their ranks, but the veteran Graybacks pressed on despite the whistling of shells overhead. The main battle of Jones' brigade sent green skirmishers fleeing up the slope toward the safety of the breastworks. Most of the skirmishers made it, but some cried out in agony when struck by rebel bullets that filled the air, striking the rocks and trees with audible thuds. All Yankees watched as Jones' graybacks arrived on the slope in force, skillfully loading and firing as they advanced on the breastworks of the upper hill. Colonel Abel Goddard's 60th New York Infantry easily withstood Jones' repeated charges. Goddard's men inflicted heavy casualties on the enemy. One of those casualties was Jones. Seriously wounded, he was carried to a dressing station, leaving his men leaderless. <laughs> Green's engineering expertise was a godsend for the Union. Without breastworks, our line would have been swept away in an instant by the halstrom of bullets and flood of men, wrote Captain Jesse Jones of the 60th New York. By this point, it was completely dark, but this did the Confederates little good. Williams, who was leading Nichols' brigade, comprising five Louisiana regiments, spent four hours trying to breach the fortifications facing it. In the darkness, relatively few men on either side were hit despite the hail of bullets, but the rebels could not get past the Union breastworks manned by the 78th and 102nd New York Infantry Regiments. When their ammunition was exhausted, the rebels fell back. Stewart had his troops on the left occupy the empty breastworks on the lower hill and commence a cautious advance through the darkness towards Green's right flank. When Stewart's men fired on some stray bluecoats they mistook as the main Union body of troops, they betrayed their position to Green's main force. The Yankees fired a withering barrage into Stewart's densely packed, packed ranks. Two of Stewart's regiments, the 10th and 23rd Virginia Infantry, managed to outflank the 137th New York Infantry, led by Colonel David Ireland. Under extreme pressure, the Empire State troops dropped back to a secondary southward-facing trench and managed to hold off Stewart's charge. Still, Ireland lost a third of his men in the nocturnal firefight. The spirited defense and the darkness kept Stewart from realizing that the Confederates' main objective, the Baltimore Pike, was situated only 600 yards in front of him. Had the rebels launched a determined frontal assault in that direction, a huge disaster would have befallen the Union forces. But Stuart, unaware of the proximity and vulnerability of this vital target, never advanced in that direction. This pivotal attack would almost certainly have succeeded during daylight, especially considering the close reinforcement proximity of the 1st Maryland Confederate Battalion. 
In the confused nighttime counter, the 1st North Carolina Brigade mistakenly fired on and pinned down the Marylanders. Also at this point, Hancock, who was on Cemetery Ridge and had become alarmed by the sound of a significant clash atop Culp's Hill, sent the 1st Pennsylvania Infantry to reinforce the 137th New York. Nevertheless, the situation was far from secure for the Bluecoats on Culp's Hill. By withdrawing a large number of troops from Culp's Hill, Meade committed a major blunder that almost cost the Union the war. Taking into consideration the mounting pressure Longstreet's assault was putting on the Union left, and that there was little activity around Culp's Hill, Meade repositioning the 12th Corps from Culp's Hill to reinforce the left. Two of the 12th Corps brigades marched off Culp's Hill, heading down the Baltimore Pike, got lost, and reached Rock Creek at dusk. In that location, they set up bivouac to await further orders. Had the 12th Corps' final unit on Culp's Hill, Green's 3rd Brigade also departed its position, Lee's army likely would have won the battle. However, as the brigade was preparing to move out, a messenger arrived with news that Confederate troops were advancing in force on Rock Creek and Culp's Hill. Green ordered his men back into position behind their breastworks and had couriers locate and recall some of the already departed troops. This still left him too few soldiers to man the lines, stretching along the ridge connecting the two sections of Culp's Hill and those extending down Spangler's Spring. For the moment, these breastworks remained empty. At 7 p.m., Green's 3rd Brigade had hurriedly moved into the vacant trenches, but they were stretched thin, trying to man its quarter-mile length. At that point, Stuart sent his infantry forward against Green's position. The, de the defenders gamely opened fire, but the Confederates' left flank charged the vacant diggings, whose defenders had earlier marched off down the Baltimore Pike. After quickly securing these positions, the rebels assailed Green's troops on the lower hill, who found themselves under attack from their front and right, as well as from behind a stone wall to their rear. Ireland, commanding the 137th New York, pulled his troops back to the traverse above the saddle, connecting the upper and lower hills. The gathering darkness aided the Federals as it partially cloaked their movement, but other Union forces on the heights mistook Ireland's maneuver as a retreat and commenced falling back themselves. Realizing the implications, Yankee officers managed to halt what could have turned into a rout. At that point, the 10th Virginia Infantry occupied the unmanned works on the south slope of the lower hill. Meanwhile, the 61st Ohio and 157th New York, unaware of the 10th Virginia's presence, were advancing on the same point from the opposite direction with the intent of reinforcing Green. Colliding with the Confederates in the darkness, the Yankees were initially driven back in confusion, but elements of the Union First Corps were trailing the Ohio and New York units and arrived in time to fight the Virginians to a standstill and secure Green's right flank. By then, the day's fighting on Culp's Hill started to fizzle out. Johnson suspected his foes were anticipating a night attack, so he forbade any further advances before dawn. He did not realize there were no federal troops between his division and the Union rear on Baltimore Pike. He did send a scouting party from the 1st Maryland Confederate Battalion to check the, for enemy movements. When these troops returned and reported seeing wagons moving along the pike, Johnson misconstrued this as a federal retreat. It was actually a supply convoy. He decided to wait for daylight to finish off the Yankees. Confederates now occupied the captured works in the lower hill from the saddle between the upper and lower hills south toward Spangler's Meadow. Ireland had established a firm defensive line on the upper hill. Far from retreating, as Johnson believed, the Federals used the night hours to move the 71st Pennsylvania Infantry from Cemetery Ridge to reinforce their presence on Culp's Hill. Around midnight, elements of the 12th Corps tried to return to their vacated diggings on the hill's southeastern slope near Spangler's Spring, only to find them occupied by Stewart's rebels. 
Williams had assumed command of the Union 12th Corps earlier that day when Slocum assumed control of the right wing of the Union Army. Williams was unwilling to resume the chaotic nocturnal fighting, so he had the troops bed down in an open field in front of the trench and wait for dawn. During the early hours of July 3rd, Williams laid plans to assault the rebel positions on the lower hill at daybreak. Under cover of darkness, he quietly moved artillery into position, overlooking Spangler's Meadow, in such a way that it could, as soon as it was light enough, fire at virtually point-blank range into the Confederate diggings. Williams shifted his division, at that point led by Brigadier General Thomas Ruger, to a position on the southern perimeter of Spangler's Meadow. A brigade of Geary's division set itself up in an east-west line along the tree line bordering Spangler's Lane. Another brigade, commanded by Candy, reinforced Green's troops. With the Federal attack scheduled for daybreak, the artillery was to open its preliminary barrage at 3.30 a.m. Also during that busy night, Walker eventually joined the attack, deploying his troops facing the Federals across Spangler's Meadow. Two additional brigades from Rhodes' division of Ewell's Corps, led by Brigadier General Junius Daniels and Colonel Edward O'Neill, reinforced Johnson's command on the right and center facing the upper hill. Brigadier General William Extrabilly Smith's brigade of Early's division forded Rock Creek to extend the Confederate left from Spangler Spring. Lee's plan for that morning of July 3rd was to launch coordinated attacks on Culp's Hill and Cemetery Ridge, but Longstreet could not get his forces deployed in time. The Federals did not wait for him and opened up with their field pieces. One of the first Maryland Confederate Battalion officers, Major William Goldsboro, described the shelling. To add to the horrors of the situation, a battery or two opened upon the division at close range, and most of their shells fell among the men of Stuart's brigade, who were compelled to closely hug the ground behind the breastworks for protection. A more terrible fire men were never subjected to, and it is a miracle that any escaped. The Union guns had opened fire promptly at 3.30 a.m., inflicting grievous casualties on the graybacks dug in on the lower hill. The shelling did not last long, though, as Lt. Col. Ariel Pardee's 147th Pennsylvania Infantry charged across open ground and quickly routed the decimated defenders from behind their stone wall before they could draw beads in the gloom of late pre-dawn. At 4 a.m., the Yankees to the right also advanced, but collided with a furious countercharge by the Graybacks facing them, driving the Federals back in disorder. The Rebels attempted to follow up the success by launching several assaults on the northern positions on the upper hill, but each was driven back with heavy losses both from entrenched blue infantry and by fatally accurate shelling from William's cannon above Spangler's Meadow. By 6 a.m., the Revels had ruefully broken off their charges up the upper hill. Louisianans of Nichols' brigade exchanged fire with Union 12th Corps defenders atop Culp's Hill on July 3rd. Confederate General Robert E. Lee's plan for the morning of July 3rd was to launch coordinated attacks on Culp's Hill and Cemetery Ridge, but Longstreet could not get his forces deployed in time, and Ewell's attack went forward prematurely. We tried again and again to drive the enemy from their position, wrote Lt. Col. L. H. Sawyer of the 50th Virginia Infantry, but at length we were compelled to fall back, worn down and exhausted. At one time we were within a few feet of their works, but the fire was so heavy we could not stand it. At this point, Williams ordered Colonel Silas Calgrove, commanding Ruger's brigade, to make a reconnaissance foray in front of the Union right. Possibly due to a mix-up in communications, Calgrove instead ordered the 2nd Massachusetts Infantry and the 27th Indiana Infantry to launch a direct assault on the Confederate positions facing them. When Lt. Col. Charles Mudge of the 2nd Massachusetts heard the directive, he remarked, Well, it's murder, but it's the order. He sent his men across 100 yards of open field facing strong defensive positions. The Massachusetts troops charged straight ahead across Spangler's Meadow, while the Hoosiers galloped across the field in a northwesterly direction. 
Both units were met with blistering musketry that stopped the 27th Indiana Cold after it had traversed one-third of the field's length. The second Massachusetts made it almost all the way across the field before piling up in front of Confederates who had set themselves up along a line of huge boulders. Both attacking elements were slowed by the meadow's muddy ground, which hampered their mobility and made them easier targets. And so, just as the situation seemingly could not get worse for the blue soldiers, the defenders were reinforced by a brigade of Smith's Virginians. The blue coats gamely held on until running out of ammunition, and then the survivors fell back. The sole result of this mistaken charge was that these two Union regiments were decimated to the point of uselessness. Immediately before the charge of the Indiana and Massachusetts regiments, the 1st Maryland Potomac Home Brigade, under Brigadier General Henry Lockwood, had advanced at a gallop from the Baltimore Pike to Spangler's Meadow. This inexperienced unit did fairly well versus stout opposition, endangering the rather thinly held Confederate line boarding Pardee Field. However, the Marylanders became confused and halted, thinking they were attacking their own troops when they saw a number of blue soldiers crossing from right to left in front of them. This was actually the ill-fated charge of the 2nd Massachusetts. Lockwood led his men back to the Baltimore Pike, aborting a charge that might well have rolled up the sparsely manned rebel line. By 6 a.m., both sides had settled into a heavy exchange of musketry between lines that were not widely separated. Two hours later, Johnson commenced a series of attacks all along the battle line. These were beaten back with commands of Daniels, Williams, and Stewart taking heavy losses from both small arms and artillery as Green rotated regiments in and out of the breastworks, enabling them to maintain a high rate of fire. At 10 a.m., Johnson launched his final assault with Stewart's brigade, charging from the southern border of Pardee's field. This unfortunate unit again suffered ghastly losses from infilating artillery fire and riflemen that sent surviving gray soldiers back in disordered retreat. To the right of Stewart's troops, the 1st Maryland Confederate Battalion and the 3rd North Carolina Infantry advanced through a wooded area that afforded some cover, but these units could only advance as far as the saddle between the upper and lower hills before being stopped cold by Williams' artillery. The last significant Confederate attack kicked off at 10 a.m. as the Stonewall Brigade and Daniels Brigade charged Green's position from the east while Stewart's Brigade advanced across to open ground toward the position of Candy's and Kane's Brigade on the upper hill, where the Federals had been too busy fighting during the past 24 hours to throw up any breastworks. In the face of accurate and well-coordinated artillery and rifle fire, both attacks were beaten off with heavy losses. About this time, the inexperienced 1st Maryland Potomac Home Brigade was bloodily repulsed while trying to take a stone wall traversing the open field parallel to the Union works. Handy hurriedly sent his 147th Pennsylvania Infantry to reinforce the Marylanders, enabling them to carry the field and secure the wall. Yet, the drama continued for the moment. Williams later described the Confederates' hysterical counterattacks. The wonder is that the rebels persisted so long in an attempt that the first half hour must have told them this was useless. Johnson's division lost about 2,000 men, nearly a third of its complement. Another 800 from reinforcing units fell on that grisly July 3rd. During July 2nd and July 3rd, the Union 12th Corps lost approximately 1,000 men. Many more lives would be lost in the months to follow, but the success of Green's Brigade atop Culp's Hill contributed substantially to the eventual end of the bloody civil war between the North and the South. This concludes part one of this three-part series. Please like, follow, and set notifications for parts two and three as we examine the administrative failures and the politics of July 2nd at Gettysburg. It's your history. Learn it. 
know it and love it.